This is the new 2023 Mercedes-Benz EQE 350+, Plus, and it's a mid-size, fully electric luxury sedan from Mercedes-Benz. Think of it as like a smaller version of the full-size EQS luxury sedan. It's the latest in a series of new Mercedes-Benz fully electric models to come out and go on sale, and today I'm going to review the new EQE and show you all of its quirks and features. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And you should, because we've had some great sales lately, like this R33 Nissan Skyline GTR, which sold for just under $50,000, this wonderful Volvo V60 Polestar, which sold for just under $55,000, thousand dollars and this old school Porsche 911 Cabriolet which sold for around 37,500. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, Cars and Bids is the place to do it with daily auctions and free listings. Check it out at carsandbids.com. All right, time for the quirks and features of the new EQE, and I'm going to start with the basics. Pricing, performance, where this fits in in the lineup, sizing, that kind of stuff. So, EQE, like I said, a little bit of a smaller version of the EQS, and the naming is intentional to correspond to other Mercedes-Benz models. The EQS is the full-size sedan, supposed to be roughly equivalent to the S-Class. The EQE, the mid-size sedan, is supposed to be roughly equivalent to the E-Class, so that's why they've called them that, and that's why this is the EQE. And indeed, sizing is about the same. EQE looks a lot different from an E-Class, but it's 196 inches long, give or take, and that's roughly the same size as an E-Class, so they're about the same size and same market position, just this one is electric. So as for EQE trim levels, they're going to start off with two. This car is debuting as the EQE 350+. Plus. That's this version, and it's the only one that you can get right now. It's rear-wheel drive, fully electric, like I've said, about 290 horsepower and about 390 pound-feet of torque, pretty strong. Zero to 60 is in the mid-five-second range, according to Mercedes-Benz. Now, later, the EQE 350+, Plus will be joined by a more powerful model called the EQE 500. That's going to have 400 horsepower and standard all-wheel drive, as opposed to rear-wheel drive for this. Now, pricing for the 350+, Plus, this car starts around $79,000 while the 500 will start around $87,000 when it comes later. And as for range, Mercedes-Benz says around 300 miles of range for a fully charged EQE sedan in optimal conditions, which is relatively competitive with rival electric sedans. Now, in addition to being kind of a smaller EQS in terms of pricing and sizing and market position, it actually looks like a smaller EQS too. The EQE basically has that same sort of egg shape, very aerodynamic, that's the goal. It helps them to maximize range. Now, on the EQS, this design has gotten some real criticism. People think it looks a little weird, a little funky, they don't like it. I personally think it's kind of cool, but it's definitely a departure from the norm. I will say it looks a lot better in the EQE. This weird egg-shaped design just seems better when it's scaled down a little bit. It looks nicer, more attractive, and a little bit more conventional. I also love the wheels on this EQE. They look like thin five-spoke wheels from a distance, but you get close, and they're actually flat plates, which is what most automakers want to do with their electric cars. It helps to improve aerodynamics having a flat surface on the wheel, but nobody likes how flat surface wheels look. A lot of automakers have tried to get their flat surface wheels to not look like flat surface wheels, and this is the first one I've seen that really kind of pulls it off. You have these thin, sporty five spokes as part of this AMG sport package for this car, and they look good despite being aerodynamic friendly. Now, a couple of interesting things on the outside, especially in the front of the EQE. For one thing, this little panel on the driver's side front fender. You might be wondering well, what that is. Is that where you plug in the electric charger? No, no. You push that, open it up, and it's where you add washer fluid to this car. Windshield washer fluid goes in that little door on the outside. Now, you may be thinking you've never seen that before. Don't you just add washer fluid under the hood like every other car? And the answer is no, because the hood doesn't open. 
open. Just like on the EQS and the EQS SUV, the EQE's hood is fixed in place. You can't open it. It's all mechanical stuff under here. No extra cargo compartment and no washer fluid adding area. Now, also interesting up front, you have a big grill, as you can see. Not really needed on an electric car. It's just there for style. And when you get closer, you can see the little marks in the grill aren't slats or openings like in normal cars. Instead, they're little Mercedes-Benz stars all throughout the grill. Many of these Mercedes-Benz stars to add a little Mercedes-Benz quirk on the outside of this car to the grill. By the way, one other interesting quirk on the outside worth pointing out, the door handles remain flush with the body when the car is locked. When you unlock the car, as you can see here, the door handles pop out, then you can reach in, grab them, and open them. But when the car is locked, they're flush. Two big reasons for this. Number one, it just looks better. When the car is locked, the door handles are flat, but also it helps with aerodynamics. You don't have these door handles sticking out, breaking up the wind going past the car. They're locked in place close to the body when the doors are locked. And next up, we move inside the EQE, and there's a lot to talk about in here. For one thing, this car is offered with the hyperscreen, just like the EQS, the giant screen that goes from basically one side of the dashboard all the way to the other, 56-inch screen. It's available in the EQE, but with that said, I suspect the hyperscreen won't be all that common in the EQE. It's already not all that common in the EQS, which is a more expensive car where it's optional. This one being more affordable, not too many people going to get it. This particular EQE is equipped to around $87,000, pretty well spec'd, and it still doesn't have the hyperscreen. It's probably not going to see it that often unless you special order. Now, if you don't get the hyperscreen, I do like the fact that the space where it would have occupied is instead covered in Mercedes-Benz star logos, just like the grill in front. They're kind of subtle, but also kind of cool, and they add a little quirk to the interior. And as for the interior, I gotta say, I really like the inside of this car, especially up front, looking at the instrument panel, the dashboard, the screens. I think it all looks really nice and it's designed well. I love this sweeping line going from the top of the dashboard all the way down the sides, the top of the doors. I think that looks great and I love that it hides the center climate control vents. It's kind of a cool integration of those above the big center screen. It's a nice interior of this car fitting with what you'd expect at the price point and I think that luxury car buyers will be happy with it. And there's a lot of nice materials in here. No cheap crappy plastics to look and touch you don't have that. Instead, a lot of aluminum trim, high quality stuff. Everything looks and feels nice all throughout the interior, the door panels, the dashboard. You even have this surface at the top of the dashboard. This is usually a cheap plastic, but instead it's not here. It almost looks like Alcantara, but it doesn't feel like that. It's something sort of in between Alcantara and plastic. Not sure what it is. Haven't really seen it before, but it looks nice in this interior. Now, even if you don't get the hyper screen in the EQE, you get a fantastic fantastic infotainment system. In fact, this giant center screen is what you get in the new Mercedes S-Class, the flagship luxury sedan. Well, it's the lesser version of what you get in the EQE, and it's still great. You have a massive screen here, tremendously responsive, tremendously intuitive, very easy to figure out, high resolution, obviously full color. Everything is great with this screen. Mercedes-Benz MBUX system has evolved so dramatically, and this is the best iteration yet. It works great. It's easy to use and it's fantastic. Now, one drawback that some people might see is that the climate controls are integrated into the screen. No physical buttons and switches for the climate controls, but they are always stuck to the bottom of the screen in the same place. There's no screen you can go on that eliminates the climate controls. You don't have to go into any menu to pull them up. They're always right there, which is almost as good as having a traditional button or switch for climate changing. Also worth pointing out, you got a fantastic camera system in this car. This amazing around view 360 camera, really high quality, and it shows you a great field of vision around the car. You can see basically everything really excellent. Now, also in the vicinity of this screen, some interesting things going on here. For one, this little black box is a fingerprint reader. If you teach the car your fingerprint, you can get in, put your finger on the black box, and then it will pull up your driver profile. Instead of having to like remember which key you use and your spouse and all that, or press memory buttons for stuff, you can just get 
get in, put your finger there, your driver profiles pulled up, your presets, your climate control, whatever you want, it's all there, which is a pretty cool idea. Now, a lot of people will look at this center control pad and say that less cool is a slider for volume. Instead of just a dial, what is this about? Well, it works. It actually works really well. You slide your finger, volume goes up and down exactly like you'd expect, and uh, may not be a traditional dial. That's what they did, and I don't really see a drawback. You even have a slider for the sunroof control in this car. As you can see, slide your finger back, and the sunshade opens up, and once that's all the way open, you slide your finger back again, and the sunroof opens, and you do the same to close it. You just slide in the forward direction, and then that stuff closes. No buttons or switches in here. Not sure if it's cheaper to make these sliders or just more futuristic, but either way, that's what they've done. Now, also in this interior, and worth pointing out, underneath the center console in this car, you have, well, storage, because you don't need a transmission or a drive shaft to go through the center of this interior. Instead, you can use space like this for storage, and so they do. You can put a purse there, bags, other stuff, whatever you want, and you have a couple of USB-C ports down there as well. Now, you have even more USB-C ports on the upper part of the center console, and in fact, this car is only USB-C. They don't even have a 12-volt cigarette lighter style outlet in this car. So if you have some accessories that plug into that or into USB-A, well, too bad. You don't anymore. If you have an EQE, you're going to have to upgrade to USB-C. Now, also worth pointing out in this car is the gauge cluster screen directly ahead of the steering wheel. You can see, again, excellent. High quality, full color, great resolutions, fantastic, just like it is on a lot of modern cars and especially a lot of modern Mercedes. I love their gauge cluster screen and I love how configurable it is. You can show various different screens, including a full-size map, if that's what you want to see, or other stuff. You can emphasize your driver assistance. Whatever it is that you want, you can dial it up on that gauge screen, more configurable than almost any other automaker. And by the way, speaking of driver assistance, that's also fantastic in this car. I've reviewed it in other Mercedes-Benz models, and I'll link some of those reviews below where I go into more depth. But basically, this car can be hands-off for a long time. When you're on the freeway, it'll steer, brake, accelerate, even change lanes for you. You got to sit there and monitor it, but it has a capacitive touch steering wheel. So as long as you have a hand resting on the wheel, it'll know you're there paying attention, and it will basically do a lot of the driving for you as long as you just monitor forward. It's a really great driver assist system, basically among the very best in the car industry. And next up, we move on to the backseat in the EQE, which I have to say the big selling point here is the backseat is absolutely massive. You can basically lie down back here, relax. You got a lot of leg room, knee room, hip room. It's really huge. Even though the EQE is roughly the same size overall as the E-Class, the big benefit here is there's no engine up front, and that allows Mercedes-Benz to really stretch the wheelbase of this car, move the front wheels forward, and move the rear wheels further back since there's no drive shaft or other mechanical components. Instead, you just have interior space. It gives you a lot more room than a standard gas-powered car with a standard big engine up front, and it really shows in the back seat. Basically, full-size sedan rear seat room in a mid-size sedan. Now, with that said, a couple of items worth pointing out back here. For one thing, you do have climate vents in the back, but you don't have climate controls. I'm sure that's optional, but for $87,000, which is what this car costs, I would expect to have a rear seat climate zone. You also have a couple of USB-C ports in this panel, as you can see. And again, no 12 volt, no USB-A. It's USB-C only in this car. Other stuff worth pointing out, nothing really huge or interesting back here. You don't have a giant center tunnel in the floor like you do in a lot of gas-powered cars because, again, no drive shaft going through. So you got a little bit more space for that middle seat passenger if you want. Although, with a middle seat passenger in place, you won't be able to get to your cup holders back here. The only cup holders you have are in this fold-down armrest. Fold it down, open it up, and that's where your cup holders are. So you got to choose between a middle passenger or cup holders. Now, one other thing worth pointing out in the back of the EQE. Again, the material's very nice back here. Leather feels good. Everything looks good. Nice aluminum trim. And you have that same kind of cool material at the top of the door panel that you had at the top of the dashboard. It looks good, although I don't like the fact that it just abruptly ends at the end of the door. It really ought to continue on to the B pillar instead of just stop. It looks a little cheap that they just pulled it out and the B pillar is something completely different. There should be a better transition there. And next up, we move on to the cargo area, the trunk and the EQE. But before we get in there, a little interesting quirk with how to open the trunk. You look around, you don't really see an obvious trunk handle, nothing above the license plate. Instead, it's the Mercedes-Benz logo. You push the top of it, and the trunk opens right up, which is kind of a cool little hidden quirk. 
But once you get into the cargo area, you can see the trunk is really big. It goes pretty far back in there. Deep trunk for a mid-sized sedan, although the opening for the trunk is kind of small. That's a function of the EQE's design. This sort of egg shape pulls back the rear window, and that means it kind of encroaches on the trunk opening. So you got good space in the trunk, but a slightly smaller opening to get there. Now, there's even more space under the floor, as you can see, lift it up, and there's a little extra storage there for smaller items, valuable stuff that you don't want rolling around. Now, one other interesting thing about the EQE cargo area, you can put down the back seats from the trunk. And in a lot of cars, there's like a switch or a tab that you pull in order to get the seats down, but not here. Instead, there's buttons mounted on the bottom of the trunk lid. You can see here L and R next to the power trunk closer buttons. Never seen this before, but if you press L, obviously the left back seat goes down and R, the right one goes down. Now, these aren't power operated rear seats. You can't press them again and have the seat come back up. Up, but you can put them down from back here, which adds some convenience. If you have a longer item, you don't have to go around to the seats and manually fold each of them down. All right, driving the new EQE sedan. Now, I'm a big fan of the EQS. I love, I actually like how it looks, which is unusual. <laughs> Most people don't. But also, I just think it drives great. I think it's a like a really great luxury car. Super comfortable, super nice inside, and I really like driving it. But it is big, and it is expensive. And so this car seems like kind of a, a budget EQS, plus it's better looking. It just is. It simply is a more attractive car. The design works better on a smaller scale. So how does this drive? Well, first things first, it doesn't quite have the same level of luxury and luxury feel as the EQS does. That's not to say it does not feel luxurious because it in fact does. Very quiet in here, very nice compliant ride. Honestly, it doesn't feel that different from a nice E-Class, which I guess is kind of the point of this car. Not exactly the most fun. I'm flooring it here and it's fine, but you get that initial surge of acceleration and then not an enormous thing after it, which is kind of a general drawback of electric cars, but it's especially true in this case. It's just doesn't feel particularly quick or exciting in what would be the higher end of the power band for a gas powered car. It feels fine. And the same is true for handling. It's predictable, it's, it's stable, but the steering is not exactly the fastest. Some electric cars, you can really mess with this stuff and give them like fast steering, even if the handling's not that great. That's not what they did here. It does not have the fastest steering. It does not feel incredibly quick or incredibly like exciting to toss around. The car is obviously way more composed than the EQS, the full size. It definitely feels like sportier and more exciting. And I actually think that the EQE 500 or even a future potential AMG model could be cool because it could have big power in like this relatively small size package, but you're gonna have to have some suspension upgrades to make that like a really desirable car. Because as it sits now, this is, it's a car. Like it drives like a mid-sized kind of average luxury sedan, but it doesn't, it's not fun or exciting to drive. Now, I don't think that's really a drawback of this car. I'm just pointing it out. I think most of the people who buy these aren't really gonna be looking for that. It's gonna be E-Class buyers who wanna go electric. And unless you're getting an AMG E-Class, you're not really looking for something performance or exciting. Now, the feel of this car is nice. It does feel like a luxury car. It, it, it's, it's quiet, it's comfortable. It doesn't, again, have like the EQS's full-size, big car, true ultra luxury feel. Ultimately, this is just a good kind of plain mid-sized luxury sedan, but a good one with good tech and a comfortable driving experience and decent acceleration. You can't say anything really negative about this car other than it's a little dull. So maybe I'm waiting for an AMG version and maybe that'll be more fun. But for a lot of the mainstream buyers of electric cars, I think this car is gonna check a lot of boxes and I think there's a lot of really nice benefits about it and I think it drives well and I like it. And so that's the new 2023 Mercedes-Benz EQE. If you're a Mercedes-Benz fan or an electric car fan and you want a nice electric luxury sedan, this is a fantastic option and it's far more reasonably sized and reasonably priced than the huge EQS. And now it's time to give the new EQE a Doug score. And the Doug score is here. The EQE 350 Plus gets a 56 out of 100, which places it here against some rivals. I actually think the EQE is a nice car, but it's let down by its styling and the fact that it's pretty dull to drive, especially for the price point. However, Mercedes has EQE AMG models on the way, and I'm excited to see how they drive. I suspect they'll be a lot more fun. For now, the 350 is a nice car if you want to go electric, but if you're a little unsure of new brands like Polestar or Tesla, and you really want to stick with Mercedes-Benz. Hey!